Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing receptor tyrosine kinases. Okay, right, so we just discussed the RAS pathway, okay, which leads to the activation of the MAP kinase, uh, also called ERK enzymes, okay, which then uh, trigger uh, the activation of transcription factors which promote differentiation and proliferation of cells. Okay, we're now going to discuss another pathway that receptor tyrosine kinases which can activate, and this is the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway. Okay, now we've discussed that the RAS pathway is going to activate cells to divide. Okay, uh, now the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway is going to facilitate this because if you think about it, what do we need in order for a cell to divide? So if we have our cell here, in order for our cell to go from being one cell to being two cells, our cell firstly needs to grow. Okay, and in order to grow, you need to increase the size. Well, you need to increase the number of proteins you have, and you also need to increase the number of intracellular organelles you have. Now, uh, by activating the RAS pathway, you're going to activate the transcription of genes, which will produce you the mRNA for producing proteins. However, if you're actually going to turn that into an increase in the amount of protein that the cell has, you need to translate the mRNA into protein. Okay, so. If the uh, translational machinery of the cell is going to be able to deal with this increased mRNA load, then we need to get an activation of the translational machinery of the cell. And this is what the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway is going to do. It's going to activate the translational machinery of the cell. Okay, so let's now discuss this pathway. So we'll start off once again by just discussing where we've got to with our receptor tyrosine kinase. Okay, so uh, just a little bit of revision now. So here is the phospholipid bilayer here. Okay, then we've got the amino group uh, of our first receptor tyrosine kinase extracellularly. Okay, then we've got our ligand binding domain here. Okay, then we've got our membrane spanning alpha helix here, and then our tyrosine kinase domain intracellularly down here with the carboxylic acid terminal down here. Okay, right. So, let's colour in the different portions here. So here is our tyrosine kinase domain. Okay, here is our ligand binding domain in orange. Now remember what's happened is that ligand has come and bound to our ligand binding domain here. That has changed the conformation of the ligand binding domain so that it can now dimerize with another ligand binding domain of another receptor tyrosine kinase. So here is another ligand binding domain on another receptor tyrosine kinase that has also got ligand bound to its ligand binding domain here. Okay, so in turquoise there's our ligand. And here is our other ligand binding domain here. Okay. Then this other receptor tyrosine kinase will also have a membrane spanning alpha helix and then a tyrosine kinase on the intracellular aspect down here. And then the carboxylic acid terminus down here. Okay, right. And when you get this dimerization of the receptor tyrosine kinases, this brings the two tyrosine kinase domains of these two receptor tyrosine kinases close together. They then autophosphorylate each other. Okay, so this tyrosine kinase uh, phosphorylates this one, and this one phosphorylates this one. The phosphorylation of these tyrosine kinase domains then results in their activation, and they now phosphorylate these tyrosine residues in the neighbouring cytoplasmic tail, so you're going to get more phosphate groups added on, okay, around the tyrosine kinase domain, like so. Okay, so I'll colour these in, in purple, so these are additional phosphorylated tyrosine residues, or phosphotyrosine residues. Now, uh, these phosphotyrosine residues are now going to serve as the residue on which another protein is going to bind. So remember, we've discussed that the phosphotyrosine residues serve as docking sites for proteins which have SH2 domains within them, or alternatively, uh, phosphotyrosine binding domains, PTB domains. Okay, so we've seen that one such protein is the growth factor receptor binding protein 2. What we're now going to see is another example of one of these proteins which combines to 
phosphotyrosine residues. Okay, and this is going to be PI3 kinase. Now, before we discuss PI3 kinase, I would firstly like to discuss what um, the PI3 kinases are going to do. Okay, so let's just discuss what the PI in PI3 kinase actually stands for. So the PI stands for phosphoinositide. So the P is for phospho, the I is for inositide. Okay, and then we've got phosphoinositide free kinase or PI free kinase, and even shorter, it's usually just abbreviated to PI free K, like so. Okay, right. Uh, so all of these, uh, well, all of these names refer to a family of enzymes uh, which are going to phosphorylate phosphoinositides. Okay, so I want to start off by discussing what phosphoinositides are, and then we'll come back to discussing the phosphoinositide free kinase family of enzymes. So in order to discuss what phosphoinositides are, I need to discuss what phosphatidylinositol is. And in order to discuss what phosphatidylinositol is, I firstly need to discuss what a phosphoglycerolipid is, and in order to discuss what a phosphoglycerolipid is, I need to discuss what a phospholipid is. So we'll start off with the definition of a phospholipid. Okay, right. So we've seen earlier what uh, a lipid molecule is. A lipid molecule is one which it has an extremely neutral structure, and that means that it doesn't interact well with water, which is a very polar molecule, uh, and is therefore deemed as hydrophobic. Okay, right. So, let's now see what a phospholipid is. So, a phospholipid has to obey two criteria, okay? It has to firstly have a long-chain carboxylic acid within its structure, okay? So, we've seen an example of a long-chain carboxylic acid earlier on. We saw palmitic acid as an example of a long-chain carboxylic acid, a carboxylic acid molecule which has this really long hydrophobic tail. Now, the more sort of prototypical example of a long-chain carboxylic acid would be stearic acid, okay? And uh, stearic acid is very similar to palmitic acid. Its new name is octadecanoic acid. Okay, so it's a 18-carbon, uh, fully saturated carboxylic acid. Right, and I'm just going to pause this video here whilst I get a new pen.